Are the Gospels eyewitness accounts that we can potentially trust? No. Or are they second or third hand claims that we should skeptically reject? Yes. Is there anything left to say? Oh, Paul, you should know that lawyers always have something more to say. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. And today I'm joined by a former lawyer taking a look at the claims of a former detective. Confusing? Well... Our guest today, Jay Werner Wallace, became a Christian while investigating the Gospels with the tools of a homicide detective. And my guest today is Godless Granny. She left Christianity after investigating the religion with the tools of a lawyer. Thank you so much for having me. Let's have a chat. I never thought about my using the tools of a lawyer to investigate my religious beliefs. But you may be onto something there, Paul. The first major crack in my faith came when I looked at my own faith from the viewpoint of an unbeliever. In doing so, I reasoned my way into the divine hiddenness problem. Since attorneys need to look at how their case appears to a juror who has never heard the evidence, yes, I think you're right. But we're going to kind of focus down on the claim that the Gospels are eyewitness testimony. Now, what okay. I love about you is you don't approach this as an ac academic who's read books. I've read Detective Wallace's books, so I know that he reads books. But Sean saying Jim hasn't read books is still funny. You've been examining eyewitness testimony and presenting this kind of evidence before a trial. So you're kind of bottom up rather than top down looking at this approach in a sense. Now, before yeah. we get to your case that the Gospels contain eyewitness testimony, what kind of training did you get as a detective to be able to identify and analyze eyewitness testimony? Well, everyone who starts as a patrol officer, right, that gets some training even before they get training because you're taking reports and you're interviewing eyewitnesses. The first thing I note is that Sean's question here doesn't quite match up with Wallace's answer. It's a subtle difference and probably not intentional on Sean's part. Sean's question started with a statement. You've been examining eyewitness testimony and presenting this kind of evidence before a trial. Then... He asks what kind of training Mr. Wallace had for this. Mr. Wallace answers the question, but lets the error in Sean's statement slide. The detective never presents evidence in court. The attorney does this. The detectives will be called as witness, but this is giving evidence, not presenting evidence. I think there's an important distinction. Detectives don't make a case. They don't elicit testimony. They do elicit answers to their own questions during their own investigation but never at trial. I don't know whether Mr. Wallace let this go as he wanted to concentrate on the question that was asked, or if this is a subtle way of making it sound like he, as a detective, can make and present a case. I point that out because I frequently notice subtle inconsistencies between what Mr. Wallace says he will provide as evidence and what he ends up presenting evidence for. If you compare like the Gospels to like Peter Pan, like the author of Peter Pan never sure. claims that it's, that it's, it's history. He never claims that he's, he's viewing this as an eyewitness. The gospel authors are quite different. Luke says, I, 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 yeah, I didn't see this stuff. I was with Paul in the book of Acts, but, but I, I talked to the people who were the eyewitnesses. No, he doesn't. He was referring to Luke 1, 2, which says, Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. That doesn't say that Luke talked to eyewitnesses. It says that he wrote down what was handed to him by eyewitnesses. We really don't know what that means. It could mean that he received a written account that he's basing his information on, and the written information was handed to him by an eyewitness. It could mean that he spoke to someone who says that they talked to an eyewitness. Handed down to us doesn't necessarily mean firsthand. If the author of Luke spoke to an eyewitness or eyewitnesses, he should have identified the witness. In court, there are times when you can testify to what someone else said, and we'll get into that in a bit. But you could never testify to having received information from a witness and not identify who that witness was. Could anyone possibly corroborate your claim? How could they verify it? They can't. Even if you find a witness to the event, if they say, I didn't say that, it doesn't mean that someone else didn't say it. I point that out because believers often say people living in Jesus' day could verify the claims of the Gospels by talking to the witnesses. No, they can't, because none of them are identified. 
except Peter. Were you really there? I mean, how do I, I got to test this thing because you can make any kind of claim. I don't know if you were really there. I got to start to investigate those issues. Were you really there? Yes, this is correct on the place to start. Lots of people like fame, myself included. Some will try to be the hero of a murder case by claiming to be a witness, even though they weren't, for the attention. So yes, the first question is, was the witness really there? Unfortunately for the Gospels, we can't answer this question. We don't know who wrote them, let alone whether or not the authors were really there. Okay, so we haven't gotten in, into your case yet, but do you think the Gospels could pass as testimony in a modern court of law? Is that relevant or not relevant in determining their reliability and historicity? No, they would not be admitted in a court of law, and it is not relevant. He's spot on there. There's absolutely no way that the Gospels could ever be evidence in court of the events in them or what people said as evidence of the veracity of the events or words. They can be evidence of other things, but not of the truth of the words themselves. And here's why, because there's a hearsay rule. So so hearsay, basically, you under the in, in the United States, you have the right to confront your accuser. And if you cannot confront your accuser, that testimony is not allowed to be heard. So if I came in and said, hey, my dad told me that he talked to this guy and he said X, well, th 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 someone's going to say, well, then get your dad in here because you didn't hear it. Your dad heard it. You can't re testify for your dad. Uh, he, you can't be cross-examined. That's correct. The way that it's taught in law school is hearsay is an in-court statement about an out-of-court statement offered for the truth of the matter asserted. If what you are trying to prove is that the statement was made and not that the statement is true, then it's not hearsay. For example, if someone had testified that the witness's dad was mute, and the witness says, I heard my dad say, whatever, that isn't hearsay. The testimony is that you heard the statement, and the witness did hear the statement. What the statement is, is irrelevant. I, I can't, you can't ask me the question. Well, what did you, what was he wearing? I don't know. My dad just said he said this. Okay, then get your dad in here so I can ask all the questions that can cross-examine the accuser. Okay. But my dad's dead. This is common. There are lots of exceptions to the hearsay rule that will allow testimony about what a deceased person may have said. My favorite one is the excited utterance. People rarely lie when they are in a state of extreme emotion. For example, if you heard your dad say, Holy mother of God, Jim just shot my wife. That is likely to be admissible if your dad is dead. Even without the expletive, but the expletive helps. A person who just witnessed a murder, particularly the murder of a loved one, is going to be in a state of heightened emotion. So anything you hear them say while in that state is likely to be admissible. This could be said of some portions of the gospel. If someone said, I heard Thomas say, my Lord and my God, when he saw Jesus' wounds. This would qualify as an excited utterance. However, we would need to be able to identify the witness that heard this. This is the problem with the Gospels being anonymous. Even the things that qualify as exceptions to the hearsay rule still don't qualify as evidence because we don't know who the alleged witness is that is telling us this. Was the witness really there? Is the witness just seeking attention? We don't know. The reason for this exception to the hearsay rule is it makes it easier for us to put on evidence that is likely to be true. The purpose of the hearsay rule is to keep out testimony that we have no way of determining whether it is true or not. All people lie from time to time, which doesn't make a person a liar, as Ray Comfort would have us believe. In some cultures, lying is customary when it makes a guest feel good. It's considered polite. The hearsay exceptions were developed to reflect that people rarely lie in certain circumstances. The excited utterance is one because you don't have a chance to reflect on a lie. When you blurt something out in direct response to current stimuli, it's very unlikely that you lied as you didn't have a chance to think up a lie. The whole purpose of the hearsay rule is to keep out testimony opposing counsel has no opportunity to question the veracity of. Circumstances that make for testimony to have a high confidence level of truthfulness are the basis for an exception to the hearsay rule. Now, just because something falls within an exception to the hearsay rule alone will not get the evidence in. There's also the best evidence rule. So in the case of an excited utterance, if the person who made the statement is available to testify, by the best evidence rule, you need to call that person to testify. However, if that person is unavailable, 
For example, if they are dead, then you can get the testimony in through the exception to the hearsay rule. Does that make sense? In other words, exceptions to the hearsay rule are out-of-court statements that we have good reason to believe are truthful. These can be admitted into evidence to prove the truth of what they assert, despite the fact that they were made out of court. Another favorite of mine is the dying declaration. The reasoning behind it is if a person believes that they are dying, that they are about to meet their maker, they are unlikely to lie. After all, a person won't want to come before God having just told a lie. I've been watching for a proposal for an atheist exception to this rule. With a far greater secular community now and the rise of the nuns, is it more likely that a person who has no belief in God would lie while dying? I don't know the answer to that one. I certainly have no more incentive to tell the truth while I'm dying than I do when I'm not dying. So it wouldn't surprise me if at some point there is debate over whether there should be an exception to this exception for atheists. Okay, well, then you can't, that testimony is not coming in. Now, there are some exceptions in federal law. Rules of evidence are not federal law. Federal rules of evidence apply to federal courts. State rules of law apply in state courts. Rules of procedure, which rules of evidence are, are often very similar or even identical from various states, primarily because when one state adopts a law, when it works, another state copies it. But despite rules being very similar, rules of evidence are not federal rules. Okay, we're not going to forget about that for a second. In the cases that I work, that's hearsay. But that's a standard that we developed for reasons of protecting the accused. It's not a standard we would apply. To. In other words, we would rather um, uh, free, um, we don't want to convict anyone falsely. We'd rather free 100 guilty people than falsely incarcerate one mm. innocent person. True. Benjamin Franklin proposed that idea, and it has become judicial philosophy. So what we do is we set a standard that's really high. But if you held the hearsay rule against claims related to history, there's virtually nothing you could know or would be allowed to know outside the lifetime of an eyewitness. So if you say, well, what were my great grandparents gotcha. like? You couldn't ask your grandparents because they're not, they can't be, you know, you can't ask your parents anyway, for sure, because they, how are they going to know? They're trusting what their grand, what their parents said. To there them. is some truth there. It's true that if you use the rules of courtroom evidence, it would be difficult to establish much of history, but it's not as impossible as Wallace claims. Documents are hearsay. They were written out of court, so they are out of court statements. But there are a number of exceptions to the hearsay rule that apply specifically to documents. The most common one used is to simply have the person who wrote the document get on the stand and testify that they wrote the document. Then the document can be admitted as the author can be cross-examined. Obviously, we can't do this with historical documents. The second most common is through a self-proving affidavit. This is how wills are admitted to court. They are accompanied by a document signed by at least two witnesses, attesting to the fact that the person who made out the will appeared before them in person and freely made this will while being of sound mind. For this reason, we can prove many historical figures to have existed and their assets and their family members by the standard rules of evidence admissible in court through their wills. Next is chain of custody. If there is a chain of custody for a document, such that there is reliable evidence that this is the original document, and the signers are the original signatories. Documents that have been in museums, such as the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, could be admitted into evidence here. Records kept in the regular course of business or activity are an exception. From this exception, you could enter into evidence ancient documents that record business transactions, a shopping list, a list of slaves owned, and so forth. Public records and vital statistics are exceptions. You could enter baptism records, birth certificates, marriage certificates, and so forth. Learned treatises or pamphlets are an exception, provided the publication is established as a reliable authority by the expert's admission or testimony, or by another expert's testimony, or by judicial notice. So, for example, if you wanted to admit an excerpt from Plato's Republic to establish a historical fact, you could call an expert to testify that this is an accurate copy of Plato's Republic and that Plato is the author of Plato's Republic, so the writing is an accurate reflection of Plato. Or the court could take judicial notice that the document offered is an accurate copy from a page of Plato's Republic written by Plato. 
We cannot do this for the Gospels, as you so aptly discussed in your video on the anonymity of the Gospel authors. Thus, they are not testimony of any person or persons known in history. The Gospels could be admitted as evidence of what they say. For example, you could get admitted that the Golden Rule is in the Gospels, but you can't use them as evidence of the veracity of the events. In other words, you could use the Gospel of Matthew as testimony that a first-century writer wrote about a zombie invasion of Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified, but you can't use it as evidence that there really was such a zombie invasion of Jerusalem on that day. For this reason, there is a great deal that we can establish in ancient history through evidence admissible in court about well-known public figures. Take Julius Caesar, for example. We have writings from Julius Caesar himself. We couldn't use these in a court of law to establish that what he wrote was accurate or and it really happened, but we can use it as evidence to prove that Julius Caesar was a real person. I highly recommend Dr. Richard Carrier's book, Jesus from Outer Space, on this point. Many believers claim that the historicity of Jesus is far better attested than that of other historical figures of the period. Not true. Dr. Carrier lists the evidence that we have for Alexander the Great, Homer, and others, and how the historical evidence for these figures far exceeds what we have in the way of historical evidence for Jesus. You need to get to the actual eyewitness. Well, can you imagine how short history, reliable history would be? It would be in the lifetime of like two, 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 two generations. And then after that, everything's hearsay. Another exception is handwritten documents. If your mother is deceased, but you have letters that she personally wrote, you can testify that this is her handwriting, you recognize her handwriting, and you can get the letters admitted into evidence. There are some limitations on this, though. This just gets the document admitted, and this is true of all documents that I have discussed as evidence. When seeking to admit documents for their truth, you must analyze all the statements in the document to ensure that both they and the document fall within a hearsay exception. So you can't trust anything in history. That's not how we do history. So you can apply the uh, the, the uh, criteria that we use for eyewitness reliability to historical claims, and you should. Mm -hmm. But you, you shouldn't think that that the fact that we can't bring in hearsay in a criminal trial means we could never use it to determine history. True. Using courtroom rules of evidence to determine what happened in history is ridiculous. You have two entirely different goals. I like what Josh Bowen said in The Atheist's Guide to the Old Testament. To determine what happened in history, you look at the data points and then draw the most reasonable conclusion from the data. This is not the goal in a courtroom. We aren't looking for the most reasonable conclusion. We're looking for what we can prove. Can we prove that the pyramids were built in Giza? Yes, the evidence is still there. Can we prove that they were built by Hebrew slaves that were later freed by Moses? Absolutely not. Is that the most reasonable conclusion from the data? Again, no. Were the pyramids likely built by slave labor? Yes, most likely, as that was a common practice at the time. Could we establish that as a fact in court? No, we could not. Why would we want to? Could we establish this to a reasonable degree of certainty? I think so. Others might disagree. If that's the case, be, be ready to throw out everything you think you know about your own family. Not true. There are enough exceptions to the hearsay rule to establish your family history. There are dozens of them with caveats to a number of them. In law school, evidence was a required five-credit course. Hearsay and its exceptions was an entire week of class. Despite that, I had to look up some of these points that I brought up because the rule is so complex. I can't even remember half of them off the top of my head. So earlier you said you started kind of going to church and this time you were practicing as a cold case detective. You decide to investigate Mark in particular in the Gospels. What was your mindset going into this? And I asked because my dad was challenged by some Christians and he was setting out to disprove Christianity kind of with a legal mindset. I find this an odd claim. Josh McDowell has no legal background. I met Josh McDowell, or at least I went to a talk that he gave at my university in either 1979 or 1980. I was sufficiently impressed with him that I bought his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And that book was largely responsible for my remaining a believer for as long as I was. At no time did he claim to have a legal mindset that I recall. I understand why Sean makes this claim. The title of the book implies that it's written from a legal evidentiary standard. And the book cover art implies this as well. However, 
Josh McDowell never went to law school and had no legal training. His bio says he was interested in going into law and went into apologetics instead. But even portions of Josh McDowell's bio are suspect. Kip Davis recently did a video on Josh McDowell's backstory which casts suspicions on this and other claims. Kip showed his story has been consistent to the point of looking scripted as he uses the exact same words to tell his story in multiple settings. However, the first biography of Josh McDowell, Josh, the Excitement of the Unexpected by Joe Musser, tells a very different story. Josh McDowell was a freshman at Kellogg College in 1959 when he was challenged by an English professor to critique the claims of historical Christianity. He was challenged by a group of Christians to attend church with them to obtain a more balanced approach. After a few months of this, McDowell converted and began preaching in Lansing, Michigan. The following year, in 1960, Josh McDowell was an undergrad at Wheaton College, an evangelical Christian liberal arts school. Undergraduates are required to express a personal faith in Jesus to be admitted. Before starting classes at Wheaton, McDowell was invited to go to Europe as a speaker for the International Council of Christian Churches. While in Europe, Musser writes, he spoke in churches and in prayer groups in Great Britain and studied in Beatenburg, Switzerland. During his free time, he visited British courts and talked to English barristers about their trial law. I find it very hard to believe that Josh McDowell, an undergraduate at a Christian college, was setting out to disprove Christianity, whether with a legal mindset or not. Worse, McDowell claims multiple times that his travel to Europe was with the purpose of gathering evidence to disprove Christianity. Yet the biography says he was a believer, traveling on their behalf to speak for them. Which is more likely, that a 19-year-old soon-to-be college sophomore traveled to Europe at his own expense to gather evidence to disprove the Bible, or that a 19-year-old new believer on fire for the Lord traveled to Europe to preach, having been sent by an international ministry? My personal history with Josh McDowell also leaves me questioning whether he, like Mr. Wallace, is merely sloppy with his work to the point where he doesn't care if what he says is true, or if he knows that what he claims is not true. One of the first things that convinced me personally of biblical inerrancy was Josh McDowell's claim that no archaeological discovery had ever disproven anything in the Bible. Since my deconversion through Holy Kool-Aid's series on Bible history, I discovered that not only is that claim inaccurate, it wasn't even accurate when Josh McDowell made it when writing his book in 1972. Kathleen Kenyon studied the ancient city and told the world in around 1958 that Joshua didn't fit the Battle of Jericho, as Jericho was destroyed in about 1550 BCE. Bible scholars and apologists date the alleged exodus to either 1446 or 1225 BCE. Regardless of which of those dates you pick, Jericho had been destroyed 100 to 300 years before Joshua and crew arrived. Since this was well known when Josh McDowell wrote his book, I have to wonder if he made the claim due to sloppy work, he wasn't aware of this and didn't bother to research it, or if he did know about it, but he dismissed it thinking that despite the evidence that there was no battle of Jericho for Joshua, it hadn't been proven. If that's what he bases his claim on, he's right. But neither has any event in Bible history ever been proven to be true, either. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. So if we are going to accept that the things in the Bible for which we have good evidence, like that Herod the Great was king of Judea in the first century BCE, can be called historical fact even though we can't prove them, McDowell and Wallace should also be willing to accept that the things in the Bible for which we have good evidence to believe did not happen are biblical inaccuracies, even if we can't prove that they didn't happen. We should hold the Bible to the same historical standard of evidence as we do to any other event in history. I was a very committed naturalist, but I wasn't like Lee Strobel or like your dad, who said, well, let me show you why this is, this is insane. Instead, I, I just didn't know any other way to investigate any claim. Mm. So I had a, I had a, a sociology teacher. Now, by the way, I was not assigned to cold cases when I first walked in, I, but I was working a cold case. 
two different things. Uh, same skill set, though. I can't help but wonder if this is Mr. Wallace's defense to Prophet of Saad pointing out that Mr. Wallace wasn't a cold case detective when he started investigating the claims of Christianity, despite his claims to the contrary in his book. So I bought the scripture to see if, if it was actually wise. Now, as I'm reading it, it struck me that these things were variant. They, the, the details, the way that these scenes were described were not the same exactly. Uh, sometimes they would overlap because clearly if you've, if you've heard Frank Turek describe something a thousand ways and you're going to describe it, you might describe it like Frank Turek. This is not unusual, right? But a lot of stuff had variation in it, and that variation is what captured me because there's always variation between eyewitness accounts. And it's not something that's ever shaken me. As a matter of fact, I'm always suspicious when there isn't variation. And the mm. only thing we ever ask uh, the dispatcher when we get called out to a homicide is, hey, have the officers on the scene, separate the eyewitnesses, because I'm going to be about an hour and a half before I get there. I don't want them talking to each other because they'll just line up their stories. I want to see the messy puzzle because it's in that puzzling together of all the messiness that we're going to catch a bad guy. This is an ongoing frustration I have with Detective Wallace and apologetics in general. The focus on contradictions and not the problem of corroboration. Matthew and Luke copied most of Mark, a lot of times word for word for extended passages. But then, surface level apologists like Jim want to pretend that these portions of the gospel provide independent attestation. They obviously do not. And those little changes are better explained as evolving theology rather than a shift in perspective. Look at these discrepancies for yourself, but instead of asking, can these be harmonized, ask yourself, why might a later author have made this change, rather than copy it exactly? The answers can be disturbing. But it is true when someone, when people make claims, eyewitness claims, they will often include details that seem important to them but you never end up using those details in the case proper before a jury because it, they weren't really, they're just like little, in, you see this sometimes, right, with eyewitnesses, you know. Those things are called irrelevant. Evidence needs to be relevant to the case in order to be admissible. Okay. You see some of that in the Gospels. You see the, the kind of um, mm. what, what has been called um, undesigned coincidences. And not every undesigned mm -hmm. coincidence, I think, has evidential value. So I don't okay. use that term. These are the kind of... Um, these are the um, unwitting kind of statements that 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 uh, witnesses t make, uh, not knowing that they're li actually leaving me wondering an even bigger question. This is not unusual. Somebody makes a statement, and you're like, oh, "Okay, that explains A, B, and C," but now I've got a question. E I didn't have before because that seems confusing to me. But later on, you talk to another eyewitness and he covers, you know, B, C, D, and E, although he never covers A. This kind okay. of puzzling between uh, where everything kind of fits ultimately is really common in, uh, in eyewitness mm. accounts. And there are several places in the Gospels that I talk about in Cold Case Christianity that uh, those things intrigue me. Problem is, the Gospels don't line up. It's impossible. The biggest problem is Jesus or the angel telling the women to tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee. But in Luke's gospel, the disciples meet Jesus in Jerusalem on Resurrection Day and are told to remain there until they get the Holy Spirit, which would be at Pentecost about 50 days later. Luke never has them going to Galilee, as John and Matthew do. And John and Matthew never have Jesus appearing to anyone in Jerusalem other than the women at the tomb. This is a point that I learned from you, Paul. The first time I heard you say it, I was astounded. I had read the accounts myself hundreds of times, and never had I noticed this. It's because I never read them side by side. Rather, I read one account and might read another months later, and none of the churches that I attended ever recommended looking at them side by side. Why do you suppose that is? Could these both have happened? Sure, it's possible. Jesus could have seen the disciples in Jerusalem, then a week or so later in Galilee. But what's hard to believe is the disciples, who are all believers after seeing Jesus appear to them in Jerusalem, would then go to Galilee after Jesus told them not to do that. Weirder is Jesus telling the women to tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee, but then going to the disciples in Jerusalem and telling them the opposite. Even weirder yet is after the disciples disobey and go to Galilee despite being told not to, Jesus making no mention of their disobedience and lack of faith in doing so. So it's possible the events in the different accounts happened, but meshing the stories renders Jesus' words nonsensical. Evidence is different than an inference. So, mm -hmm. so uh, when, for example, if I'm making a case for God's existence, 
I'm using the exact same evidence that the non-believer is using. I just think the inference is different from the exact same evidence. This happens all the time. This is what juries do constantly. I disagree. It's not that the inference is different. It's that Mr. Wallace looks at the evidence selectively. He only considers the evidence that supports his claims. It's the rare believer who has ever noticed the discrepancy between the Gospels on the point of where Jesus met the disciples and where Jesus' disciples were told to meet him. When I confront believers with this point, I'm usually met with silence. The one time I wasn't, I was told the disciples made the 80-mile trip to Galilee and back, all on Resurrection Day. Is that possible? Sure. They could have all flown together on a giant pegasus. Is that even remotely plausible? No. How do you know the gospel writers intended their writings to be taken as eyewitness? Is it as simple as them just saying, we were witnesses, we we're there, we we're reporting what we saw? Is it that simple? Like, how did you assess those claims when you saw them uh, first time you were reading it? Well, sometimes it is. We, we talked, sometimes it is just that, that they've said, you know, and if you look at First Peter, look at First John, you look at places where now, of course, this is where skeptics will come in and say, well, we're going to toss those letters out because to be sure. honest, if you include those letters, you get a unifying picture of eyewitnesses who are making a claim. This is quite the claim. Nowhere in First Peter or First John do the authors claim to have witnessed the events in the Gospels. He's likely alluding to 1 John 1, where the author does claim to be a witness to the word of life and eternal life. He claims to have seen and touched the word of life. But my rejection of this as eyewitness testimony has nothing to do with harmonizing the Gospels. I wouldn't care if all the Gospels were in lockstep harmony. Rather, I defer to Bart Ehrman on this point as it's his area of study. He makes a compelling case for these not being written by the apostles. Our apologists here dismiss my rejection without ever addressing the problems, claiming that I don't want to include the letters because then you don't get a unifying picture of the eyewitnesses. It would be nice if the apologists would listen to the arguments instead of assuming their opponents are simply dishonest and dismissing what they don't want to see. If you are now thinking, wait a minute, Granny, didn't you earlier dismiss Mr. Wallace's claims of harmony based on your claim that he sees only what he wants to see? Yes, I did. But I also backed that claim with my experience with believers who won't or can't address that issue. Further, nowhere could I ever find where Mr. Wallace has addressed this issue. I see apologists try to harmonize the number of women at the tomb, the time of day, the number of angels, and who said what to whom. Most of this I consider to be irrelevant detail. Most of these are the kinds of things that I would expect to find differences on with multiple eyewitness testimony. One witness may not have seen all of the women and relates the story with fewer women, for example. But whether a resurrected Jesus appeared in Galilee, Jerusalem, or both is huge. This is supposed to be the most important event in all of human history. Whether Jesus appeared only once or multiple times is your alleged evidence of resurrection. And even your own Bible says that if Jesus is not raised, your faith is futile. So if you want me to accept your claims of the Gospels being in harmony, you need to do two things. First, reconcile the Jerusalem-Galilee problem. Second, address the arguments Bart Ehrman raises in his book Forged as to why scholars reject 1 Peter and 1 John as being written by the apostles. Hand-waving away the problems with the texts isn't going to cut it. But the authorship, like, is that really Peter? Or is that really, rather, is that really Matthew? Is that really John? Or is it a different John? I don't care who it is. I don't care if the authors of these four texts are the, one of the official, later on, big wig, you know, top name uh, apostles. I don't care if they're, because the, the issue is, 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 it, is, the, is, the, is it the writing of an eyewitness? I, I, don't, I don't need it to be author, given authority because it's Matthew who's wrote it. What if it's Matthew's uh, buddy John or uh, Phil who happened to be, you know, not never mentioned in the scriptures, but he happened to see the whole thing and so he wrote it down. Would, I need to know, is it reliable eyewitness test? The, uh, the actual uh, who is attributed to it is not a big concern for me. Now, mm. I'm going to say this as somebody who's looking at it as a non-Christian, right? Because I was a non-Christian when I first read it. So it didn't matter to me. That's quite the concession, Paul. I think you are having an impact on the apologists here. 
along with Bart and the other New Testament scholars. I see this as Mr. Wallace's concession that a robust case cannot be made for the authorship of the Gospels, being the people whose names appear on them. Mr. Wallace doesn't care if the Gospels are anonymous, provided the authors were witnesses. I see Mr. Wallace as having dug himself into a huge hole here. Earlier, he told us that establishing that the witness was really there was of crucial importance. Now he concedes that we don't even know who these authors really were. If we don't even know who they were, how can we possibly establish that they were there? If the text had said, I was there and I saw these things, yes, but we don't have that. Trying to shoehorn First John's claims of having seen the word of life as meaning that he was a witness to alleged events described in the Gospels is a huge stretch. And then you look at it and say, when Luke says, yeah, I was speaking to the eyewitnesses and servants of the word, and I've looked at all the objections to that language. It's torturous. I mean, the reality of it is the plainest reading of that language is, is that Luke was with Paul, you know, years after the resurrection and had to talk to people who had seen the resurrection in order to write his gospel. I don't see that as a plain reading of the text. Do you, Paul? I do not. I was going to leave this be, as I already covered that the text merely says that the eyewitnesses handed down to the author what he has written. Nowhere does he ever claim to have spoken to these witnesses, nor does he claim that what was handed down to him was handed down firsthand. But Mr. Wallace makes a big deal of this as being the plain reading of the text. It's not plain to me. If I didn't know anything from a common sense perspective, but I did know the 13 questions that are in the California jury instructions, well, then I said, okay, I don't know. I don't know anything about eyewitness testimony, but I know that judges are tell jurors that they need to consider these 13 things when they're listening to an eyewitness on the stand. This is noteworthy because I previously reviewed a video where Mr. Wallace made the claim to the audience that there are four criteria for determining the veracity of eyewitnesses in the California jury instructions. This is the four criteria. Now, to make it easier for you, I'm going to give it to you as four simple concepts with one word each. And right off the bat, Wallace fails the test, because here are the California jury instructions for determining the credibility of witnesses. There are five, not four and the four do not match up with his list. The video was from a conference in 2021. The 2020 edition of the jury instructions were in effect then, and I showed how the criteria only lined up with one of the actual instructions. Here are the current jury instructions, and there are 14, but several only apply in some cases. Now I'm curious if he will use the actual list or make up his own, as he did for the 2021 audience. If I broke those 13 things down, into four major categories, there they are. Is it written early enough to be written by an eyewitness? Can it be corroborated in some way? Has this guy been honest and accurate over time or has he been changing a story? And third, mm -hmm. does he have a motive to lie to me? Those are the things we test. Nope, he made up his own list again. Is this written early enough? The closest question to this is, how well does the witness remember? The way courts address the testimony as not being stale or old isn't through jury instructions. It's through the right to a speedy trial. Can it be corroborated? As you see, that isn't on the list. There isn't anything even close to this. There is no requirement that testimony be corroborated. Has the witness been changing his story? This one is there. It's number seven on the list. So here we are one for three, although Mr. Wallace considers this number two. I'm not sure how he's numbering his. Does he have a motive to lie? Yes, this one is on the list. It's number five. He called this one number three, but it's the last one on his list of four, so I'm not sure how he counts. But either way, two out of four of his criteria are not on the list, and most of the instructions for evaluating eyewitness testimony he ignores completely. You don't suppose he might be ignoring these because they don't help his case now, do you, Paul? I try not to speculate on motive, but it's suspicious. Yeah. So I thought, okay, let's test him under those four criteria. Now, the first one is going to be, is it is this early enough to have been written by an eyewitness? So Acts, I'm not as concerned about as I am the four Gospels. But Acts okay. gives us the key that unlocks the dating of the four Gospels because as you kind of lock down the writing of Acts, it, it ends up backing up the writing of Luke. And this backs up the writing, or backs mm -hmm. it in time, up to uh, whatever he's considering an eyewitness account. And, and he's, he's clearly comparing his account in the first chapter of Luke to other early accounts. Since Luke's account is a careful account, as opposed to Mark's account, 
I guess that makes Mark's gospel the sloppy account? Luke had to write his gospel because Mark did such a bad job of it that he needed to clear some things up? And yet, we are supposed to believe that both the careful work and the sloppy work are the inerrant words of God. Live your life. That's a pretty good note to end on, so I'll say thank you so much to Godless Granny for lending her unique perspective to the proceedings. She declares all kinds of apologists out of order on her underrated YouTube channel. So if you haven't yet subscribed, head on over now, link in the description, and tell her that Apologia sent you. Thanks for watching, and until next time, later.